Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Achieving a Full APU Market Basket Increase webinar. My name is Sharon Purcell, and I will be your host and moderator today. Before we be begin today's presentation, I have a few housekeeping items to share with you. This webinar is being recorded. It will later be posted to the Home Health Quality Reporting Training webpage on the CMS website. We will provide you with details on accessing the recording via email when it is available. If you'd like to download today's presentation, click the Browse To button found in the Web Links panel in the lower portion of the screen to access the shared files. The presentation is also posted in a download section of the Home Health Quality Reporting training webpage. If you download the presentation after launching the webinar in Adobe Connect, you will need to return to the webinar by clicking the Adobe icon located in the taskbar. Due to the large number of attendees on today's webinar, we are unable to send questions over the phone. But you can submit questions electronically. The phone lines will be on mute for the duration of the presentation. The, the audience is in a listen-only mode and will only be able to communicate with us by using the Q&A panel. If you need technical assistance during this webinar, please let us know by entering your question or concern in the Q&A panel to the right of the presentation. You may also ask content-related questions via the Q&A panel. We will address questions submitted at the end of the presentation. Responses to all submitted questions will be published on the Home Health Quality Reporting training webpage. An email will be sent to alert you when the Q&A document is available. For additional assistance with Adobe Connect, you may click on a help icon in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Closed captioning is available during this webinar. You will find the captions located in the panel directly beneath today's presentation. If you need any technical assistance with closed captions, please let us know by entering your question or concern in the Q&A panel to the right of the presentation. During the presentation, we will occasionally engage the audience in polls. The presenter will read the question and possible answers. And the poll will appear in the panel to the lower right. If you want to see all answers to the polling question in the polls panel, you may have to scroll down. When prompted with a question, you, you simply review the possible answers and select your desired response. Once you select your answer, it will automatically be submitted. Now let's give polling a try. How many people, including you, are joining this webinar together in the same room? A, just me, I am the only one participating. B, two people. Th C, three or four people. D, five or more. Now submit your responses. Okay, it looks like most people are in the rooms alone. So A is the most popular answer. Now let's try to do a second poll. Let's try it again. Approximately how many certified home health agencies, HHAs, were there throughout the United States in 2018? A, 8,500, B, 10,000, C, 12,000, D, 15,000. Select your response. Okay, it looks like most people are selecting C with 12,000. Let's see what the correct answer is. The correct answer is C, 12,000. In 2018, there were 11,869 Medicare certified home health agencies throughout the United States that serve approximately 5 million beneficiaries. 
Now I'd like to introduce the speakers. Presenting their Achieving a Full APU Market Basket Increase webinar are Heidi McLadry, Lori Teachman, and Kathy Roby. Heidi McLadry is a Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services Home Health Quality Reporting Program OASIS lead. Heidi is a registered nurse, and prior to joining CMS, she spent the last 13 years working in a home health industry as both a visiting nurse and a nurse supervisor. Lori Teichman has been with Home Health Care Consumer Assessment of Health Care Providers and Systems, that's HHCAPS, since its development in 2006. Lori has also worked on hospital CAPS and now hospice CAPS. She has been a CMS employee for 25 years. Kathy Roby is a senior consultant for home health care at Qualadyne. As an educator, Ms. Ms. Roby focuses on training clinicians, improving home health provider clinical outcomes, and reducing acute care hospitalizations. She works closely with home health providers, providing education, process management, and quality improvement training to achieve better patient care outcomes. As a dedicated educator, Ms. Roby has taught clinicians at all levels to utilize quality management processes to improve quality of care outcomes. Active in the Connecticut Association for Home Care and Hospice, she remains committed to the continued improvement of community-based services to meet patient care needs. Kathy holds an MS in Healthcare Administration from the Harvard Graduate Center, a Master's in Education from the University of St. Joseph, and a BSN, Bachelor of, of Nurses from the University of Connecticut. She is a certified trainer for integrated chronic care management. We are pleased to have such experienced and knowledgeable speakers presenting today's webinar. Heidi, Lori, and Kathy, thank you for presenting today. It is now my pleasure to turn the session over to the presenters. Heidi, Lori, and Kathy, you may begin. Hi, this is Heidi McGladry. So let's get started by um, looking over today's agenda. During uh, today's Achieving a Full APU Market Basket Increase webinar, we will cover the basics of the Home Health Quality Reporting Program. We will cover Reporting OASIS and HCAPS data, CASPER on demand reports, the reconsideration process, resources, questions and answers. We will conclude today's webinar with a question and answer session. As a reminder before we begin, we encourage you to submit your questions in the question and answer panel, the Q&A panel, to the right of the presentation. We've included uh, a reference list of acronyms that will be used throughout today's presentation. I will not review each of these acronyms, but please know that they are available for you to reference on these three slides. We love acronyms. A disclaimer now has been provided for your review. Please keep in mind Medicare policy changes frequently, and please refer to the links provided in the presentation for the source, source documents. We encourage you to review the specific statutes, regulations, and other interpretive materials for a full and accurate statement of their contents. Objectives for today's webinar are to discuss the Home Health Quality Reporting Program and relationship to the annual payment update or market basket increase. List the steps for reporting outcome and assessment information set or OASIS and the health care, home health care consumer assessment of health care providers and systems, or HCAP, survey data. Describe the certification and survey provider enhanced reports, or the CASPER reports, that inform OASIS submission errors. Define the reconsideration process and the HHQRP life cycle. And identify the resources available to assist home health providers to achieve a full market basket increase. Let's get started with the basics of the Home Health Quality Reporting Program. So what is the HHQRP? 
It was implemented in Jan on January 1, 2007, and at that time, the OASIS was identified as the collection instrument. The program promotes the delivery of safe, high-quality, person-centered care. CMS holds quality health care for Medicare beneficiaries as a high priority, and to that end, we define quality in the following areas. Effectiveness, providing care processes and achieving outcomes as supported by scientific evidence. Efficacy, maximizing the quality of a comparable unit of health care delivered or unit of health benefit achieved for a given unit of health care resources used. Equity, providing health care of equal quality to those who may differ in personal characteristics other than their clinical condition or preferences for care. Patient-centeredness, meeting patients' needs and preferences and providing education and support. Safety, preventing or reducing risk for actual or potential bodily harm. And timeliness, obtaining needed care while minimizing delays. When we talk about the home health quality reporting requirements, it's important to note there are in fact two requirements. The first requirement is the OASIS data collection and submission, and the second is the HHCAPS survey data collection and submission. Medicare certified home health agencies must comply with both of these reporting requirements. This graphic displays the components of the Home Health Quality Reporting Program, or the HHQRP. As we have noted, the Quality Reporting Program includes both the OASIS and the CAPS. Compliance with both of these components is necessary to meet the program requirements. Let's take a step back now and just focus on the OASIS part of the submission requirements. As most of you already know, Providers must collect and submit OASIS data at specified time points. Those time pick points are start of care, resumption of care following an inpatient facility stay, recertification within the last five days of each 60-day recertification period, other follow-up during the home health episode of care, transfer to an inpatient facility, death at home, and discharge from the agency. There are some OASIS exclusions. Home health agencies should not submit OASIS data for patients who are receiving only non-skilled services, for whom neither Medicare, Medicare Managed Care, Medicaid, nor Medicaid Managed Care is paying for the home health care services, who are those who are receiving pre- or postpartum services, those and those who are under the age of 18. In fact, from a data submission standpoint, for the OASIS item set, item M0150, current payment source for home care, should have responses 1 through 4 checked. If, if a response item 1 through 4 is not checked, this record is rejected. It is a fatal submission error. So make sure if you are submitting an OASIS assessment to CMS that one of those response options is checked. OASIS data submission. OASIS data needs to be submitted and accepted in the system in order to ensure compliance with the Home Health QRP and prevent a reduction in payment. What does this mean? This means submitted and accepted within 30 days of the date the assessment is completed, or as many of you call the MU90 date. It is highly recommended that you submit data within the first 14 days, ideally 7 to 14 days to be extra safe, and to be sure that it is accepted by the 30-day deadline. If you experience any issues, you still have plenty of time to ensure the acceptance of your data. The OASIS data submission compliancy thresholds have been incrementally increased and are now set at 90% for the calendar year 2020 and beyond. This next slide illustrates the different terminology we use in the Home Health Quality Reporting Program. The focus of this webinar is on the data submission requirements. We've also included here, just for your reference, information about the data correction deadline and the data submission limit. 
Now let's talk about the Annual Payment Update, or APU. Many of you also know this as the market basket increase. CMS annually updates the prospective payment rates provided to home health agencies for furnishing home health care services. This annual payment update occurs on a calendar year basis. The APU applies to Medicare fee-for-service home health payment rates, meaning home health agencies that are billing Medi the Medicare administrative contractors for services provided to Medicare beneficiaries. Section 1895B3B of the Social Security Act requires that the home health payment update be decreased by two percentage points for those home health agencies that do not submit quality data as required by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. The mandate to report this quality measure data to CMS with the resulting reduction in the Medicare payments for non-performance is commonly referred to as a pay-for-reporting program or pay-for-reporting requirement. Section 484.225I of Part 42 of the Code of Federal Regulations provides that home health agencies that meet the quality data reporting requirements are eligible to receive the full home health market basket percentage increase. Similarly, home health agencies that do not meet the reporting requirements are subject to a 2% percentage point reduction to the home health market basket increase. For purposes of calculating compliance with the requirement, OASIS data collection is measured from July 1st through June 30th each year, and we call that the performance period. Starting with July 1st, 2017, to June 30th, 2018 performance period. The quality assessment only, or the QAO performance requirement, is increased to 90%. How does CMS measure this OASIS pay for reporting compliance? CMS developed criteria to measure compliance with the requirement to submit OASIS data by using the quality assessment only, or QAO metric. CMS uses matching OASIS assessments for each patient. These matching assessments create a quality episode of care. These scenarios have been, ident has, have been defined as quality assessments that create a quality episode of care during the reporting period or are consistent with creating a quality episode if the reporting period were expanded to an earlier reporting period or into the next reporting period and we're going to walk through these. Number one is a normal quality episode. It consists of a, a sock or a rock and a matching end of care assessment that neatly falls within the July 1 to June 30 performance period. Number two is a late sock rock quality episode. This is when the sock rock occurs between 5-1 and 6-30 or in other words, the visit occurs in the last 65 days of the performance period. Number three, an early end of care quality episode is when the end of care occurs between July 1st and August 31st. Or in other words, the visit occurs in the first 65 days of the performance period. Number four is a sock rock pseudo episode, quality episode. This is when the sock rock is followed by one or more follow-up assessments, such as a recertification, that occurs between May 1st or June 30th, May 1st to June 30th, or in other words, the follow-up visit occurs in the last 65 days of the performance period. The fifth type of episode is an end of care pseudo episode. This is when there is an end of care assessment that is preceded by one or more follow-up assessments, for example, a recertification that occurs July 1st to August 31st, or in other words, the follow-up assessment occurs in the first 65 days of the performance period. Number six is a one visit episode quality episode. This happens when you only make one visit. 
this type this may happen, for example, if you went out to do a start of care or resumption of care on a patient, and then the patient suddenly dies or relocates and you only make a single visit. Number seven are neutral assessments. These types of assessments will have um, an M0100, a MU100 reason for assessment of four or five, and are neutral. These assessments don't count toward or against the pay for reporting requirement. Number eight covers all the non-quality assessments. These are the assessments that don't meet any of the prior seven definitions. For the QAO calculation, the top number or numerator is the number of quality assessments times 100 divided by the denominator, which is the number of quality assessments plus the number of non-quality assessments. This is a graphic of the entire cycle of the home health data collection, submission, and determination that informs the outcome of the APU for a home health agency. We will review this life cycle in greater detail later in the presentation, but it is helpful to see how the components of this timeline fit together. We just finished talking about the OASIS data collection and submission of the, and the QAO calculation, which occurs each year from July 1st to June 30th. As you can see, the activities on this cycle span a two to three year period. This graphic shows an example of the cycle for the calendar year 2020 APU. The cycle begins with the data collection period for CAPS and OASIS data. It includes a period for CMS determination, reconsideration request, and final decision prior to determination of the APU. For a home health agency to receive their full payment in 2020, the threshold of 90% of on-time submissions had to be met during the data collection year. All home health agencies meeting the 90% threshold requirement will avoid the 2% reduction in their annual payment update. This whole cycle spans over a three-year period. A failure to meet the submission threshold during the data collection year will affect payment in the calendar year two years later. To assist providers with monitoring their QAO performance, providers receive a quarterly informational report generated and placed in the CASPER folder. This report provides an example of the agency's current QAO performance score based on data from assessment submissions over the most recent 12 months. It is intended to help home health agencies monitor their OASIS compliance with the annual pay for reporting requirements. This, interim, this performance report is available in January, April, and July. Agencies are encouraged to closely monitor these interim reports and investigate any discrepancies or concerns prior to receipt of the QAO annual performance report, which is available in October. This slide take is a, represents what the QAO interim performance report looks like. You can see at the top of the report, it references the period. This is January 1st, 2018 to December 31st, 2018, interim performance report for quarter two. If you skip down in the blue area in the box, it tells you that this agency has a 98.1%, and it indicates that this home health agency would pass the annual QAO performance requirement because the current QAO score was greater than or equal to the 90% criterion. This second slide just shows you the bottom of that same report, and it gives you a breakdown of the types and numbers of quality assessments. The QAO annual report reflects the agency's actual, actual OASIS compliance rate for the period of July 1, through June 30. It's used to determine the individual agency APU market basket update for the following calendar year. 
again, home health agencies must score at least 90% on the annual QAO metric or be subjected to a two, point, two percentage point reduction. And remember, this report reflects only the OASIS portion of the HHQRP requirements and does not include HCAPs. This is an example of what the annual QAO performance report looks like. The annual report will always have the July 1 to June 30 date at the top. This one is for July 1, 2017 to June 30, 2018. Again, by going into the box and the blue, the blue writing, 99.2%. This home health agency passed the annual QAO performance requirement because their QAO score was greater than or equal to the 90% criterion. And again, here's a look at the bottom of that same report that has the tallies of the number of uh, quality assessments for start of care, resumption of care, the end of care assessments, and how the QAO uh, score was calculated. The QAO interim and annual performance reports will remain in the CASPER folders for 120 days. They can be downloaded and saved in, the, in your agency's records, and we would certainly recommend that you do that. There is additional information regarding the HHQRP requirements, the QAO metric, and data submission deadlines it can be found on the CMS Home Health Quality Reporting web pages. Now let's move on and talk about the Home Health CAP submission requirements. All Medicare certified home health agencies must participate monthly, all 12 months, in order to receive their full APU. Agencies must contract with an approved survey vendor. You must authorize your vendor to submit data on your behalf. Vendors must successfully submit data to the Home Health Care CAPS data center. The data collection year for Home Health CAPS data is April 1st through March 31st. And with that, I will transition to Kathy Roby to talk a little bit more about the data. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I hope that somebody out there is getting sunshine because here I'm certainly getting wet. Let's talk a little about reporting the data for the OASIS and the patient satisfaction. Reporting OASIS and CAPS data in order to meet the Home Health Quality Reporting Program requirements Providers must meet the requirement for both OASIS and CAPS. The data must be submitted and accepted on time. So when do we submit this data? Oh, for OASIS specifically, the data needs to be submitted and accepted within 30 days from the date the assessment is completed, Moon 90. An agency has exactly 30 days to accurately submit their OASIS data. Remember, the act of submitting the data does not equal acceptance of the data. So it's highly recommended that, as it has been said, you submit this data within the first 14 days of the 30-day period, ideally 7 to 14 days in, to be safe. This way you can be sure it will be accepted by the 30-day deadline. If you experience any issues or rejected files, this will leave you plenty of time to ensure that corrections are made and your data is accepted. Unlike the 14-day recommendation, 30-day submission timeframes are requirements. They are not a recommendation. They are requirements. If you need more detail on what to submit, as well as complete information about the OASIS and its requirements, we recommend that you preview some of our previous learning events. 
These can be found on the CMS website. We will share these and other resource links with you at the end of the presentation today. So once you've collected your data, where are you going to submit it? OASIS data is submitted into the CMS Quality Improvement and Evaluation System, more commonly known as QIES, Q-I-E-S, the Assessment, Submission, and Processing, or ASAP system. To submit into the QIES ASAP system, providers need to take several steps. These include first obtaining a CMS net user ID and password. Then, ensure that the proper software is installed on the computer that you plan to use for this process. Obtain a key's user ID and password, and ensure that the OASIS records are in the proper electronic file format for submission. An important resource that you can use for submitting your OASIS data correctly is the OASIS Submission User's Guide. This will show you how to log into the KEYS system, and it will walk you step-by-step step through the data submission. It's available for download on the Welcome to the CMS KEYS System for Providers webpage. It's also available from the KEYS Technical Support Office, QTSO, or QTSO website. These links are listed on the slides that you will find in the resource section at the end of our presentation today. You will want to make sure that you reference this guide for any questions you may have about the submission process. <clears throat> Excuse me. Before your data can be submitted, you will have to be sure that your OASIS data is in the proper electronic format file, that is XML. It is important to receive training to ensure that your submissions will be in this correct format, that they have the correct information, and they can be accepted by the KEYS ASAP system. Some agencies use their own software for submission that is part of their existing electronic medical record system. Some providers choose to use the Home Assessment Validation and Entry System, or the JHaven software which is a free software program available from CMS. So how do you know that the data you have submitted has actually been accepted? The KEYS ASAP system will confirm that the submission was received. It will include the name of the file you submitted, but this does not mean your data was accepted. The OASIS Agency Final Validation Report, FVR, will verify the acceptance or rejection of the OASIS records. Print and copy, keep a copy of this confirmation from FVR. This is your proof that your OASIS data has been accepted. Remember, the FVR is the only way to verify that your submitted files were in fact accepted. There are, as we said, resources available to help you. You can refer to the OASIS Submission User's Guide for detailed information about submitting your OASIS data into the ASAP system. This guide is available for you to download from these locations. The Welcome to the CMS Key Systems for Providers webpage, the OASIS User Guides and Training page on the Keys. Technical Support Office, or QTSO, website. And that link is on your slide. If you require additional assistance, you may contact your state OASIS Automation Coordinator. The OASIS Automation Coordinators assist home care providers with facilitating their initial transmission of test data for new home health agencies, providing ongoing technical assistance to the providers on the transmission of OASIS data. The hyperlink on this slide will give you a list of who the current OASIS coordinators are by state with their contact information so that you can identify and reach out to the person for your state 
should you have difficulty or issues you need assistance in resolving. For HCAP's data submission, I'm going to turn this over to Lori so that she can go through this section with you. Lori? Thank you so much, Kathy. The HCAP's survey data are submitted to the Home Health Care CAPS Data Center, and your authorized survey vendor is responsible for submitting your HHCAPS data for you. Only the vendors submit the HHCAPS data. The data submission deadlines occur quarterly, and they are on the third Thursday in the months of January, April, July, and October. Home health agencies must successfully submit Home Health CAPS data for all months in the APU period to be compliant. In other words, they are supposed to submit 12 months of data. It is continuous data collection. Home Health Agency survey vendors submit the survey data for the HHAs. And the survey data center is maintained by RTI International. They are the federal contractor for the national implementation of home health caps. The HHAs can check their data submission reports in a secure portal that's called for HHAs only, or for HHAs, we've renamed it only for for HHAs, it's on the website that's on this slide, and they use user IDs that were given to them from RTI. But HHAs, of course, assign their own passwords, and they do that in the portal. And if home health agencies ever have any questions, they are to telephone RTI at this toll-free number or email them. The um, both the email and the telephone lines have access all the time. There are, there's also coverage on the weekends. This talks a little bit about the relationship between the data submission and the vendors and RTI. Home health agencies contract with a HHCAPS vendor that's on an approved list, and the approved list of vendors is posted on the website. If they call several of them, they can make a choice. Once they make a choice, they can either put this choice, register, and select the vendor in the 4HHAs part of the website, or they can call RTI. The home health agencies authorize their vendors with RTI, and the HHAs regularly check their data submission reports, again, in that for HHAs portal. We also advise that home health agencies maintain payment to their vendors because we know that vendors stop data collection if they do not receive payment. And the home health agencies are also advised to regularly or communicate with their vendors about the data collection status or any other issues that may arise during the year. RTI, again, is the federal contractor for the national implementation of home health caps. We also advise that you contact RTI if you, if an HHA wants to change their vendor. We think that this is the best way to assure that if you pick up a new vendor and you drop the former vendor, there will be no interruption of your data collection. So we always, con we always suggest that you contact RTI when you're thinking about changing a survey vendor. We have no limit on how many times you can switch to a new vendor, but we do recommend that you switch vendors at the beginning of each data collection period or quarter, actually. And these occur at the beginning of January, beginning of April, beginning of July, and beginning of October. We have two possibilities for exemption from doing 
the, the survey. One is a size exemption that home health agencies can request annually, and the second one is a one-time exemption for newness. This slide is about the size exemption. Every year, your home health agency should count the survey eligible patients that were in the previous year. So if we're in a data collection period that starts April 2019, you would like to check the count that started in April 2018 through March 2019. If you are a very large agency, you probably do not have to do this. To apply for the size exemption, you go to the Home Health Cap Survey website, and it's a one-page form, and it has drop-down fields. It's pretty quick to fill out. And again, make sure that form is for the period that you are seeking the exemption form. Usually, we only have the one that's for the current period. Okay, here, using the example right now, we're in calendar year 2021 data collection. So the reference period is the previous year. That was April 2018 through March 2019. And we began data collection for 2021 starting in April 2019. And the exemption application for size is due March 31st, 2020. So we give everybody a year to fill that out. But we suggest you fill it out as soon as you know. The online form, again, is it's very good because it guides you through the process. Again, the size exemption is only good for one year, so every year you should be going through this process. However, again, if you are an exceptionally large agency or you know that you're large enough where you didn't have less than 60 patients in the previous year, you really don't even have to go through the exercise. You could just continue with home health caps. After you submit your exemption form for size, you will get an acknowledgement email, but the email is just an acknowledgement that your form was successfully submitted and received, but it doesn't actually give you an answer that you have now passed the APU because CMS goes through a process of verifying your um, claims um, where they do an unduplicated patient count and then they make a decision. We always advise you to save any emails you receive. And the other exemption again is for newness and again not all, this will only pertain to agencies that are new, that recently received the CMS certification number. You are exempt for one year. And again, we recommend that you save your letter with your new CCN so you have proof that you are a new agency. Now we're going to have a question for everybody to think about, and I know you'll all have the right answers. Where do you submit OASIS? data for the Home Health Quality Reporting Program. This is OASIS. And the choices that you have are the Home Health Care Survey Data Center, RTI International, the Quality Manager at your home health agency, and the KEYS ASAP system. And the correct answer is D the KEYS ASAP system. And now we have a question about who submits the Home Health CAPS data for the Home Health Quality Reporting Program. And your choices are here, the Home Health Care Survey Data Center, RTI International, your authorized CAPS survey vendor, or the quality manager at your agency. And the answer is C, your authorized CAP survey vendor. Again, they are the only person or organization that can submit your data for HH CAPS. 
And now it is my pleasure to turn back the presentation to Kathy Roby. Thank you. Let's move on and take a more in-depth look at some of the CASPER reports. I'll be giving a brief overview of the seven commonly used home health reports available with some simple explanations of how to use each of them. There are many valuable reports in the CASPER system. They are home health specific and they can help you a great deal. The CASPER reporting link is available to providers on the Welcome to the CMS Key System for Providers webpage. Home health providers with access log into the application using your keys, user ID, and password credentials. These are the same credentials used to log into the Home Health Submission Systems application where the OASIS data are submitted to the ASAP system. These home health specific reports are going to be located in the home health provider and home health quality reporting program report categories. I know that following this can be a bit difficult without seeing it on the screen, but you want to make sure that you are comfortable and familiar with logging in and locating where to find your reports. You will find more information about the reports themselves highlighted in this presentation in the CASPER Reporting User's Guide. The User's Guide is available on the CMS Keys Systems for Providers webpage and on the Keys Technical Support Office or QTSO website. The link to the User's Guide on the QTSO website has been provided on this slide. So now let's take a walk through those seven reports that you'll find once you get into CASPER. There are four types of home health agency error reports. These are intended to help you identify issues with OASIS submission and acceptance. By understanding and correcting these issues, you can significantly increase your QAO compliance rate. The four types are error by field by agency, error by month by agency, error message, and error summary by agency. We are going to walk through these quickly, so I recommend that you go back afterward and pull up your own so that you can look at them in more detail with these slides next to you. The error by field by agency report will give you a list of warning errors encountered in the successful assessment submissions during a specified period for your agency. It summarizes information about the assessments that were submitted during the period. The field in error, the number of assessments with errors in the field, the total number successfully processed, and the percentage of assessments with errors in that field. I know this is very tiny, but when you have your own in front of you, you will be able to see exactly what we've been talking about. But this is just a quick look at what the error by field by agency report looks like. Let's move on to the error by month by agency report. This report summarizes the detail about a specific error encountered in assessments submitted by the agency during a specific period. It will give you the error number, error description, the agency ID, the number of occurrences of the error for each month by the agency, the total number of occurrences of the error for each agency for the reporting period, the total number of occurrences of the error by month and reporting period, the reported records are sorted by the error number and the agency ID in ascending order. This report is especially helpful for identifying trends in increasing errors over a period of time. And as we know, trending your errors can help you to identify the root causes that can be associated with operational changes or may require operational change to correct them. Let's move on to the error by month by agency report. 
This is a picture of what this looks like, and you can see how you would identify month over month the trending. This is a little bigger and easier to read as you look at it on the page. The error message report is quite simply a current listing of the errors that may be associated with the assessment submission. It details the message type, fatal and warning, and the text of each. It sorts the reported records by the message number in ascending order. Fatal errors are errors that will result in the immediate rejection of the individual record. Warning errors are non-fatal errors that include missing or questionable data of a non-critical nature, such as record sequencing, field consistency errors, and range errors. This is a picture of what that report would look like. This will enable you to identify the message type and text, fatal or warning, and remember that these are sorted in ascending order. Let's take a look now at the Error Summary by Agency Report. This will summarize the errors you encountered in your submissions during a specified period, and it breaks that down in the following detail, by error number, error message, total number of submitted assessments processed, the number of submitted assessments with a field in error, the percentage of submitted assessments with a field in error, the reported records will be sorted by your state code, agency ID, and error message number in ascending order. This is again a picture of what that report will look like. Because this will give you trending error information, it will help you to identify the root causes, again, and that is information you will need in order to effectively have positive change. Let's take a look now at the submission statistics by agency report. This will list the submissions made by or on behalf of the agency during a specified period. It summarizes information about the files submitted submission date and time, submission ID, the number of records processed, the number of records rejected, the number of records accepted, and the percentage of records that were rejected. This submission statistics by agency report can help you to identify a time frame in which the submissions were accepted or rejected. And again, this is information you can use when you match it with the trending information to have a better understanding of what operational process changes might be needed. This is what that report looks like on the page when you pull up your agency's information and print that out. These reports that we've already looked at are reports that, as a provider, you should be running on a regular basis and saving them for your future reference. This will make it possible for you to actually analyze trending, causes of the trends that you see, and making a plan to affect any improvement that you might need. Let's move on now to the final validation report, which we have previously mentioned. The OASIS Agency Final Validation Report provides detailed information about the status of select submission files. It's critical for you to ensure that submitted records have been accepted. I can't say this often enough. Submission alone does not equal acceptance. If a record gets rejected, the agency must correct the errors that caused the record to be rejected and then resubmit the record to the ASAP system. Failure to correct and resubmit those records 
may jeopardize your home health QRP compliance. This is the reason why it is so important to submit early in the first 7 to 14 days, well before that 30-day deadline. The final validation report will indicate for you whether the records you submitted for each file were accepted or rejected. It details the fatal error or warning messages that may have been encountered. This report is auto-generated for each submission, placed in your provider's final validation report folder in CASPER. The OASIS Agency final validation report can be user-generated upon request if the system-generated report is removed from the system folder before it could be printed or saved to the local computer. As an educator, I just can't resist myself. It's very important that as a provider, you make it your habit to go in after each submission after the 24-hour period, go into the folder and look at your validation report for that submission. It needs to be part of your regular process so that you can ensure that, in fact, you are aware of warning and fatal errors and that you are, in fact, making, taking action on that information. This is what the final validation report will look like. Again, we are putting these slides in with pictures of these reports. It's not possible to really read them in this format. You need to actually run your own, then go back to this slide deck and look at your report next to what we are going over today to share with you what information you can find. The top portion of this report contains the details of the file, such as the date and time the file was submitted, the user ID that submitted this file, some home health specific information. It includes a summary of the submission statistics for the records in the zip file. Beneath this is information about each OASIS record processed by the ASAP system including record and patient-specific information, as well as any error messages that were returned for that OASIS record. Note that the number of errors and messages listed on the report for each record, each assessment, included in the submission file, is limited to a number that has been defined by your state agency. The Submitter Final Validation Report has to be manually requested. This provides detailed information about the status of a specific submission file. It indicates whether the records submitted were accepted or rejected, details the warning messages and errors. The contents of this report are very similar to the ASAP system generated report but the submitter report will display the error details for records that could not be processed by the system because the provider associated to the file could not be identified. For those instances where the KEYS ASAP system cannot produce the system-generated agency final validation report or include all records on the system-generated agency financial final validation report, the user who originally submitted the file can request an OASIS submitter final validation report in order to determine why the KEYS ASAP system could not process the records. The submitter final validation report will give you, as we said, detailed information about the status of select files. It will tell you whether the records were accepted or rejected detail the warning messages and fatal errors, and it can only be requested by the user who submitted the original file. There are severe errors for which the KEYS ASAP system either cannot produce a system-generated OASIS final validation report for the submitted file or include a specific record on this report. These errors are reported only on the Submitter Final Validation Report. 
These are 901 invalid zip file, no system generated FVR created. 902 invalid XML file, record not on system generated FVR. 904 invalid XML file, record not on system generated FVR. 3162 unauthorized submitter. This is what the final submitter final validation report looks like. For the, for the specified submission ID, the report is sorting by record number, error type description, and the item in error. Note that the number of errors listed on the report for each record included in this submission file is limited to a number defined by the state agency. The report will sort by state, Agency ID, submission ID, patient last name, first name, processing order number, assessment ID, error type description, item in error, and value in error. Quite a lot of different parts, don't you think? The Home Health Quality Reporting Program reports. If you go to YouTube, you will find there a video entitled Home Health Quality Reporting Program Reports, which is from the CMS March 2019 QRP training. You may find that this is very helpful to you. The Internet Quality Improvement and Evaluation System, IT. In 2020, a series of modernizing enhancements are being made to the system. Quality Improvement and Evaluation System, KEYS, CASPER, and ASPEN. Once updated, the whole system will then be called the Internet Quality Improvement and Evaluation System, or IKEYS. Some highlights about this upgraded system. This will be Internet-facing, and it will have the latest in system architecture and security standards. It will support flexible and user-friendly data reports, allowing real-time data for care planning and quality improvement purposes. This will provide access to important information anywhere at any time, allowing you to use mobile devices, laptops, and tablets. CMS will share more information specific to home health in the future. If you have additional questions, you can always contact the help desk at qtso.com with the phone number that is listed on this slide. Now, let's see if everybody managed to stay awake and stay with me. What report provides detailed information about the status of select submission files? Click on your answer and we'll see how we do. Oh, people are changing their minds. Let's see what the final answer is. The correct answer is OASIS Agency Final Validation Report. And we have a definite majority, 78% found the right answer. Let's move on to one more. What report lists the warning errors encountered in successful assessment submissions during a specified period for an agency? Error by field, error by month, error message, or error summary? Okay, have we made a decision group? Oh, the numbers are changing a little bit. Okay, I think we've made a decision. And the correct answer is error by field by agency. Okay, we seem to have a number of people who are a bit confused about this one. So please go back and take a look at the specific information each of these four reports will provide for you so that you can keep them separated and straight in your own understanding. We're going to move on now to the reconsideration process. We'll be exploring more specific detail about requesting a reconsideration should your agency receive a letter of noncompliance. So what is reconsideration? 
Reconsideration is a request for a review of the initial CMS compliance determination for a given agency in a given calendar year. An agency found noncompliant with the Home Health QRP requirements will receive a letter of notification, which does include instructions for requesting reconsideration of the decision. If you believe your agency has been identified for this payment reduction in error, you have the right to request a reconsideration of the noncompliant decision. So why would you submit a reconsideration request? If the agency believes the CMS finding of noncompliance is an error, or they have evidence of the impact of extraordinary circumstances that prevented timely submission of data, requests for reconsideration must be submitted within 30 days after the date documented on the noncompliance notification letter. No request will be accepted after the 30-day deadline. So how does the process work? CMS will notify agencies that are noncompliant with the HHQRP in two ways. Via the Medicare Administrative Contractor through the U.S. Postal Service or an electronic letter via the CASPER system. Agencies should look for the letter and be sure to access their CASPER system since either letter can serve as the notice of QRP noncompliance. Once you receive that letter, you must submit the request for reconsideration within 30 days after the date documented on the noncompliance notice if you want to seek reconsideration. CMS will not accept any requests after the 30-day deadline. How do you go about creating a reconsideration request? The only method for submitting the request is via email to CMS, and that request must be sent to the email address on this slide. You must do it by the 30-day deadline, and remember, the only method is going to be by email to this address. How will you create the request? The subject line should include Home Health Agency QRP Reconsideration Request and the agency CMS certification number, CCN. Include each of these items in your request. CCN, business name and address, CEO or designated contact, the CMS identified reason for noncompliance, you get this from your notification letter, the reason for requesting reconsideration, and information that supports the belief that noncompliance is an error or evidence of the impact of the extraordinary circumstances which prevented timely submission of data. Include your supporting documentation demonstrating your compliance, such as proof of submission, email communications, data submission reports from the keys, proof of approved exception or extension for the reporting time frame, a copy of your CCN activation letter, any other documentation that can support your rationale for requesting a reconsideration. Documentation will be, excuse me, determination will be made based solely on the documentation provided. CMS will not contact the agency to request additional information or to clarify incomplete or inconclusive information. Remember, Never include patient information, i.e., protected health information, PHI, or personally identifiable information, PII, in the documentation being submitted to CMS for the review. And this includes attaching OASIS records and sending those to CMS via email, because email is not a secure transmission product. Any PHI or PII sent via email will enact security violation protocol, prompting involvement by the CMS security offices, and you really don't want to go there. The reconsideration response will include 
CMS will first acknowledge receipt of the reconsideration request within five business days through an email. Following review of your request and the supporting documentation, CMS will issue its decision by regular mail through the MAC and an electronic letter through the CASPER system. If the decision upholds the finding of noncompliance, a provider may file an appeal with the Provider Reimbursement Review Board. Let's take a look at the reconsideration process timeline. Between late September to early October, agencies that fail to meet the quality reporting requirements will be notified. From early October to early November, reconsideration requests are due to CMS no later than 30 days from the date on the notification of noncompliance. CMS provides an email acknowledgement within five business days when they receive the reconsideration request. In mid-December, CMS notifies the agencies of its decision on the reconsideration request. If you need additional information about the Home Health QRP reconsideration and any other resources that you might access, please go to this web link. You can find this web link right here and in the resources section. So let's see how much we've understood about this. I know it's difficult. We did go through this fairly quickly. Which of the following statements regarding the reconsideration process is false? An agency has 30 days to submit their request. CMS contacts the agency if it has further questions. Requests can only be sent by email. CMS issues a decision by regular mail and via the CASPER system. Which of these is false? Okay. We have a little changing of our minds here, well, back and forth, and uh, I think we have a majority. And the winner is B, is false. CMS does not contact the agency for further information after you have submitted your documentation. This is a one-step process. Once you've submitted everything, CMS will make their decision based upon what you have given them. Now let's go to the life cycle of the quality reporting program process so that we can look at how compliance is determined. This picture I know can be a bit confusing to look at. Let's go across the entire cycle of data collection, submission, and determination so that we can see how the process fits together. These activities are on a cycle spanning a two to three year period. The graphic shows an example of the cycle for the calendar year 2020 APU. All the backup data to that APU decision starts in January of 2018. It begins with the data collection period for OASIS data and for HCAPs. And it ends with the final decision. So let's take a quick look at the individual components. The cycle begins with the data collection and submission. Both HCAPs and OASIS data, the two components that together are the Home Health Quality Reporting Program. You can see that the HCAPS data collection starts first, and then the OASIS data collection starts in July and goes through into June 30th of the next year. They are different collecting data collection periods. They overlap, but start and end at different times. Now let's look at the middle section. When you look at this section, you will see that once the data submission period has ended, CMS takes this time period to review your data to determine your actual compliance level. The darker purple narrow band is when the noncompliance letters go out, 
in late September to early October to those providers who did not meet the QRP requirements. The non-compliance letters are then sent out to providers who failed to reach that 90% threshold for the OASIS submissions or did not comply with the HCAP survey requirements. Now you can see the light purple, this is where the agencies complete their reconsideration requests in that 30-day window between early October and early November. The next purple band is when CMS delivers their reconsideration results so that providers who are involved in this process will be notified by CMS and that notification will arrive around mid-December. And that brings us to the end of this cycle, where the APU for calendar year 2020 is then in effect as of January 1st. Those providers who met the full APU will get their full amount. They met the requirements, they get the full amount. Those providers who did not and were unable to sustain their defense of that will be reduced by 2%. The Home Health Quality Reporting Program requirements require compliance with both components in order to receive your full APU amount. But remember, this reflects a data collection period that is almost two full years prior. In summary, it is the act of submitting the data and the acceptance of that data that determines compliance. A failure to comply with the home health QRP requirements will result in a 2% reduction in the APU and it will impact your results in Home Health Compare. Finally, we have our resources. As we have said before, we've gone through many different web links and locations for you to find additional important information. So we've given you all of these different web links together on the next few slides. Go through them. I would recommend strongly that you click on each one carefully, review the information, download and save anything that you think will be helpful to you, which is most likely every single one. The last piece here on this slide will show you how to contact the data submission and QTSO help desk so that you can get information and assistance with your data submission and with CASPER. There is a help desk and let me tell you I have used it myself many times. The people that you will speak with at the survey help desk and at the home health quality questions help desk, they are wonderful very patient and very understanding. This last slide is going to give you the Home Health Quality Reporting Training webpage. You've got a picture of it there and it will give you a great deal of information and direct you to all the many resources that you might need. Questions? I believe we have a few questions that we are going to work with. Thank you, Kathy. It's now time for the Q&A of today's webinar. The presenters were assigned questions as they re were received during the presentation. So let's begin reviewing and responding to some of the questions that came in. Um, Kathy, when speaking about the reports, you mentioned yes, that there were warning messages and fatal errors. Can you talk more about the differences between these two? Certainly, Sharon. Warning messages will alert you to inconsistencies or issues that you should be aware of or may want to address, but the issue is not severe enough to actually reject the record. A record with only a warning message is still accepted in the database. Samples of warnings could include a late submission warning, inconsistent responses or dates. But OASIS records that receive a fatal error are not accepted in the ASAP system. 
So you will definitely want to monitor your final validation reports for these errors so you can address and resubmit any rejected record to ensure that your OASIS records are accepted into the national database. There is more information about error messages and warnings detailed in the OASIS data submission specifications in the data specifications page on the CMS website. Thank you, Kathy. The next question I have, um, I have looked at the CAPS Home Health Provider pre Preview Report for our agency, and it did not seem right to me. Is it possible to request a review of our CAPS Preview Report data? Lori, can you take that question, please? Yes. You tried the um, – if you didn't see it on the four HHAs, portal, then you should contact RTI. It should be there. The last one, what's usually, if you're like between times that the, pre, that the website is being updated, they would have the old one up there. But if you don't see anything, you should contact, um, just write hhcaps at rti.org and explain that you went into the portal and you didn't see your preview report. Okay. Um, looks like I have another HHCAP question. Sure. We had some problems with our survey vendor and missed, and missed a few months of sending out the CAPS survey last year. Will okay. this impact our APU? Maybe. I can't say right now unless the survey vendor might have put in a request for a late start. And we do have a, you know, um, we have a system. They fill out a form, a request form. They explain the situation, and then they will allow a late start usually. If they didn't do that, if you missed two months, if you did ten months, it's likely you're going to pass. Thank you, Lori. Sure. Looks like I, I have a question. What percentage of OASIS submissions are required for this year to avoid the APU reduction? Heidi? Hi, sure. Um, the threshold for the QAO, or quality assessment only metric, in calendar year 2019 is 90%. So this metric is based on the proportion of quality and non-quality assessments submitted by the agency. OASIS assessments need to be submitted on time, that is within the 30-day deadline to meet the threshold. Okay. I'm going to skip around here and go to, I think I have another home health, I have a home health compare question. We heard a lot about the HHQRP today, but can you explain what home health compare is? Heidi, can you take that question? Sure thing. Home Health Compare is the vehicle by which CMS publicly displays home health data to the public. The goal of the Home Health Compare site is to help consumers compare home health providers on their performance and assist them in making decisions that are right for them. Um, when appropriate, providers can inform their patients and their family members about the Home Health Compare website and explain that the Home Health Compare website provides a snapshot of the quality of care a home health agency offers. They can encourage patients and their family members to review the quality ratings and use the site to help patients and family members make the best decisions for their care. Thank you, Heidi. Um, I have a question about, about CASPER. How many users per agency can have access to CASPER? We have only been given two. Kathy, can you answer that question? Certainly. Generally, there is a two-person limit to access. Agencies with requests for additional staff may contact the Keys Technical Support Office, QTSO, Help Desk at help at qtso.com with their request and their rationale for the request. Thank you. I have a general question. What is the penalty for not submitting OASIS data in the required time allowed? 
part two of the question. Does Medicare deny the claim for untimely submissions, or does Medicare penalize the agency or not pay the claim altogether? Heidi, can you take sure. this one? You bet. So OASIS submission is related to submission and payment of claims in that it generates the HIPS code for payment. For assessments that have payment implications, such as the start of care, resumption of care, or recertifications, upon receipt of a final claim, the Medicare systems check for a corresponding OASIS assessment. If the OASIS assessment is not found and the receipt date of the claim is more than 30 days after the assessment completion date reported on the claim, Medicare systems will deny the claim. The OASIS data set submission is a requirement of the Home Health Quality Reporting Program along with the submission of the Home Health CAPS. The penalty for failing to meet the HHQRP requirements is the 2% point reduction in your annual payment update for the, uh, for the reporting year in question. Since we are in calendar year 2019, the associated reporting year since we're in calendar year 2018, the associated reporting year is the fiscal year 2021 AP reporting year. Thus, if you fail to meet the requirements this year, your AP will be reduced by two percentage points for calendar year 2021. This payment penalty lasts for the duration of the year involved. Thank you, Heidi. Looks like we have a logistics question. Um, where can I get a copy of today's presentation? with the answers to the polling questions. Well, a version of today's presentation with the answers to the knowledge checks and rationales will be posted after the training along with the recording of this webinar. We will provide you with the details on accessing the recording via email when it is available. All materials will be posted on the Home Health QRP Provider Training webpage. Um, there is a URL for that, and I believe that that URL would be in the um, the presentation once you download it or once you receive the, the notification that, that it's available. Moving on to the next question, I have an OASIS data question. I would like to determine whether my organization needs to submit anything for OASIS in order to avoid a penalty. Heidi? Sure thing. There are three considerations for providers to keep in mind with respect to OASIS reporting. The first is when new providers should begin reporting o OASIS data. The second is when providers will be subject to the potential 2% annual payment update reduction for failure to comply with the Home Health Quality Reporting Program. And the third consideration is the patient population for which OASIS assessments are required. New providers are required to begin reporting data on the date noted on the letterhead of their CMS certification number notification letter. You're responsible for submitting data for patients that have an admission date on or after the date in your CCN letter letterhead. Thus, you do not need to submit OASIS data until you have a patient admission on or after the date in your CCN letter letterhead. If you're prevented from submitting your records within the 30-day submission deadline time frame, you may be eligible for an exemption or an extension. We recommend that you reach out to the Reconsideration Help Desk about this process. More information on this process and the contact information for that Help Desk can be found on the CMS website, HHQRP pages under Extensions and Exemptions. And the last piece is that OASIS reporting regulations apply to all home health agencies required to meet the Medicare condition of participation and are applied to all skilled Medicare and Medicaid patients for that home health agency with some exceptions. Skilled Medicare and or Medicaid patients who are excluded from the OASIS requirements include patients under the age of 18, patients receiving pre and postpartum maternity services, patients receiving personal care only. Per regulatory requirements, patients requiring OASIS will be identified on the OASIS item M0150, current payment source, by one or more of the following responses. One, Medicare traditional fee-for-service. Two, Medicare HMO managed care advantage plan. Three, 
Medicaid traditional fee-for-service, or the four, the Medicaid HMO managed care. Thank you, Heidi. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, I know there are several help desks that providers can use for questions. What's the difference between a home health quality help desk and the reconsiderations help desk? Kathy? Thank you, Sharon. Providers can email the Home Health Quality Help Desk, Home Health Quality Questions at cms.hhs.gov if they have general questions about the Home Health Quality Reporting Program, including, for example, Home Health Quality Measures, OASIS Coding and Documentation of the Responses, the Quality Manual, Measure Calculations, OBQI, OBQM, PBQI, Quality of Patient Care Stars and Home Health Compare, Risk Adjustment, Public Reporting, Quality Assessment Only, and Pay for Reporting. In contrast to that, the Reconsideration Exceptions and Extensions email box, HHAPUR, Reconsiderations at cms.hhs.gov, can be used by providers to submit a reconsideration request or to ask other questions relating to reconsideration and appeals procedures for payment determination or exceptions and extensions for extraordinary circumstances. Thank you, Kathy. It looks like we're out of time. We have responded to several of the questions that we received that we could answer today. Some questions may require additional research. If you submitted a question and it was not answered, please check the, home, the CMS Home Health Quality Reporting training webpage where all responses to submitted questions will be posted later. We will notify via email once the questions and answers document is posted. So before we wrap up today's event, I want to thank Heidi, Lori, and Kathy for the valuable knowledge shared during this webinar. Um, we also want to let you know that the full version of the slides, including the answers to the polling questions as well as the recorded version, of this webinar will be posted. We will send an email notifying you when and where those items have been posted. This concludes the Achieving a Full APU Market Basket Increase webinar. Thank you all so much for attending. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>